welcome everyone uh we have 13 people joined in in the session right now so let us wait for a minute and we'll start with the session Yes, uh, so I would like to welcome you all to the RICE session today with Lavi Nigam, sir. And sir, I would like to welcome you on behalf of all our alumni to the RICE session today. And for those uh, who are attending this session for the first time, and for those who doesn't know what Upgrad RISE is, so Upgrad RISE is basically an academic related domain learning where you can take up short term courses and live sessions with industry experts like today's. And This is how the calendar for the month looks like. So we have an exciting uh, session coming up on Wednesday as well. And we do have a session uh, on career excellence workshop coming up tomorrow, Sunday. And I request you all to make the best use of these uh, rice sessions and attend as many as you can. And this is the most exciting thing I should tell you about. And Upgrad has Upgrad is coming up with an exclusive masterclass with Rooney Skruwala, our co-founder of Upgrad, and we are having this. We are going to have a session on soft skills on nineteenth of September, and you know uh, the whole Upgrad family is going to be there in the session. And I also request you all to bring in your OnePlus buddies, OnePlus buddies, as in your friends, your family, your colleagues, to the session and make the best use of these sessions and that's it from my side and over to Lavi Nigam sir. Thank you Amit. Uh, let me quickly share my screen. All right, good morning, everyone. I hope everyone can see my screen. Can you please confirm on the chat? All right, great. Good to see a lot of familiar faces. Um, a lot of you who have joined a lot of my sessions before. Good to see you all. And I hope the voice is also clear, not lower anything bad all good okay perfect so how is everyone doing today after almost two weeks what i can guess is a lot of you might be switching jobs as i can hear uh, one of the very common things which are happening currently in industry is that people are leaving jobs uh, which is a good thing. Uh, people are joining new jobs. Uh, so how many of you are joining new jobs? Anybody who is... Ankur is doing great. Nilanjan is doing good. Congrats. Satya is doing. All right. So congrats for everybody who is um, joining new jobs. I hope you guys are getting... Um, yeah. So Harni has also joined an internship. I recently got to know. Uh, good. Um, and I hope that you guys are getting opportunities that you always wanted to work with. In fact, I will encourage uh, others who have not switched as of now to sort of start looking out. It's a good time uh, for better or worse, um, although things don't look good around the world or in India as well. Uh, but at least the IT market is for some reason flourishing. Um, so please keep trying, uh, keep looking out for jobs. There's a lot of data science jobs which are um, 
which are coming up. Uh, so please make sure that you reach out to people on LinkedIn, uh, applying and things like that. Uh, a very valid question <laughs> which Abhijit is asking. He's saying, is this a bubble? Um, I don't know, maybe. Uh, I'm not 100% sure. But yes, um, uh, more than bubble, it's something which was pending from a long time. Um, and I think the pandemic has fueled many companies to go in a digital path. Uh, and digital path will al always be followed by um, you know, people who are good with cloud, people who are good with data. Uh, these are two very high um, requirements that are going to come in the industry. I mean, we are still not at the level where you will see more happening uh, probably in coming one year. Uh, that is why I started off this uh, with this topic, which is please make sure that, you know, I think in coming one year, the cloud and data and AI, all these three things, uh, are going to be at a very high demand. So make sure that you're ready for it. Um, I have always seen people sort of waiting for the right time um, that, you know, um, I would like to first uh, study everything and then I'm going to give interviews and so on and so forth. Please don't do that. Uh, keep giving interviews. It's fine, even if it is a big firm and you're like not prepared Um I mean, yeah, it's it's not like you should always do it, um, but I would request you all to give interviews um, because that is a short, short way of knowing where you stand and what is that you need to work on rather than waiting for the right time. So please make sure that you do that. Uh, it's a good time, um, you know, uh, for you to make a switch in cloud slash AI slash ML. Um, also, something that I keep saying in all my sessions, uh, if you have not learned about any of the clouds, uh, so for example, AWS, Azure, or GCP, uh, please start doing that, right? So all of you have already studied uh, ML and all of these things, good. Uh, keep revising it, keep learning it. The second important thing, if you have already not done it, is to start learning about cloud because many companies, like many good companies are only hiring people uh, irrespective of whether they know something about ML or not. Um, but if you know any of the cloud, they are just hiring people. Um, so please do that. Uh, this is something that I've been saying a lot uh, recently. So good, um, again, I wish you all the best uh, for those of you joining new companies and for those who are preparing and for those who are planning to prepare, uh, give your best, I'm pretty sure something good will come up. Uh, with that, Azure has a good, Azure and AWS has a good exposure in market to be very honest. In fact, AWS is the one which has like the larger scope then comes the Azure and GCP has a very smaller footprint at this point, uh, but it is definitely catching up. So um, that could be one of the priorities most of you can set, which is um, you can, if you have not already chosen or you if you have not already made a choice that whether you want to go with AWS or Azure, uh, the first could be AWS, second would be Azure, and the third would be GCP. Okay, so now coming back to the topic. Um, oh, that's a very good question, Ankur. Uh, let me address that because I am pretty sure a lot of you have uh, this question. So what Ankur is saying is that, um, you know, is it enough for us? So while I say that you should all learn cloud, is it enough to sort of just go ahead and take some online tutorials and just, uh, you know, learn some basic things and not do any like bigger courses or bigger certification? Um, I would say 50-50 and I, I'm trying to be very practical here, Ankur. I'm not trying to sort of say that, hey, one cannot learn out of online stuff or free stuff is what we essentially are trying to um, understand here. Um, I would say 50-50 because yes, you can definitely go on the internet and there are like thousands of tutorials of machine learning stuff on cloud. You can watch it, you can learn it. There's no, uh, there's nothing bad with it. The only challenge, which is something we all agree happens in Indian market is that uh, most of the time, uh, employers don't validate that. So they will end up asking for 
uh, hey, did you do any certification in AWS? So what I would say is that um, if you can, um, go ahead and do a certification um, on these clouds, whichever one you have uh, selected, that would really help. Uh, not to say that, you know, if you don't decide to do it, nothing will happen. It's again, like I said, most of the time employers do um, do prefer doing that. Um, I am one of those examples which has not taken any certifications from any cloud. Um, not that I'm against it, but I've not taken it. Um, so it's not that you know you don't have examples in industry where people have not taken certifications and they are not doing any job. So you can decide on your own. Um, I would, like I said, please go 50-50 first, you know, sort of don't invest initially uh, too much, go through free stuff, um, try to see how comfortable you uh, get in any of those things. And then if it feels like you can go ahead and take certifications. Um, also for many companies, I'm not sure, um, you know, how many of you have this access. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that some of you in your companies, you would have access to free uh, certifications. Like, for example, I know Azure, like Microsoft has a tie-up with many companies uh, where they give you access to all their certifications for free. Uh, so please do explore that. Uh, same happens with AWS as well. Um, the best person to reach out to in this case in your companies is uh, somebody who is from a cloud team. So. Uh, typically a uh, IT um, uh, cloud person or anybody who's a who's a responsible person from a cloud department, go and reach out to them and ask them that, hey, do we have access to enterprise uh, learning uh, a resource where you do get free certification? So please uh, inquire that inside your company. I'm not sure um, whether it is available in all, like it, it's available in ours. I know it is available in Accenture. It is available in TCS. Uh, so if you're coming from those companies, uh, figure out who are these people who can give you those access, which essentially means that you don't have to spend money. That's that's all uh, I'm trying to say. So again, Etos has a way she's saying, so please do that. Um, um, that will be helpful. For those of you who are asking for certification in cloud, uh, all three clouds have their specific machine learning certification. Um, I don't remember the name right away, but there are specific uh, cloud machine learning. So it's not cloud certification that you all should do. Uh, you are on. You should only look for cloud machine learning and all three of them have. So if you just do a simple Google search, you should be able to um, get those things. All right. Okay, perfect. Um, <clears throat> so we'll address uh, remaining question towards the end of the uh, thing. Uh, let me quickly sort of, for those of you who are attending my session for the first time, um, let me sort of give you a heads up of how do we do the session. So the sessions are going to be very interactive. We're going to do a lot of discussions. I don't take any of you as somebody who um, uh, who is very fresh in these thoughts and very fresh in this topic. I take all of you as somebody who have gone through the course, who have taken these things, who have learned these things, who have explored this on your own. Uh, so that's why there's a lot of discussion that we're going to do. Um, it's not going to be boring. At least that's what I think. Uh, so we're going to do a lot of discussions. We're going to do a lot of um, industry use case discussions around topics, around things. Uh, and then we'll jump right into hands-on, which is always my favorite. Um, so that's pretty much uh, how we sort of do the session uh, mostly. Uh, all... The question that I, I don't answer, I'm sorry for that because there, there are a lot of questions. What you can always do is uh, two things. One is you can post the question on Q&A and I can take it towards the end. Um, even if I miss out on that, uh, you can always reach out to me on LinkedIn. So if you just search my name on LinkedIn, you should be able to see. Uh, you can always post your question uh, there. I always uh, respond to people on LinkedIn. So if there's anything specific that you want to ask, anything which is not part of the topic or part of things which we are not discussing, you can always reach out to me on LinkedIn. Okay, so now coming back to the topic, uh, the most important topic and most uh, fun topic in my uh, sense, um, so Parmeet, just search with the same name. My name is Lavinigam. If uh, some of you don't remember, it's right there on the slide. So you can just search for it. 
so the topic today that we're going to do um uh, is ml model monitoring now let's try to sort of understand why this is a very interesting topic and like i said uh, it's not something which is new right um you know it's it this is one of those things which is very uh, very logical uh, something which is some in the moment we'll sort of study it you most of you will be like hey this is so logical this is not even sort of a new theory altogether but there's a good and the bad part the good part is most of the things that we're going to discuss in terms of theories are going to come from the same thing um uh come from the same thing that you all have studied uh, across your whole machine learning which is a good part because you don't have to sort of relearn anything new the bad part and i'm you know this is this is a more subjective bad part uh, some of you will be happy some of you will not be happy is that this is more to do with coding so all the model monitoring stuff has to do a lot with designing systems and softwares uh so there's there's nothing like scikit learn kind of a thing where you can just do uh scikit dot model monitoring and you get the monitoring so there's nothing like that so which is where you know the bad part is because in most of the cases what you might have to end up doing is you have to design your own own infrastructure you have to write your own codes you have to write your own dashboards so it's lot of uh, those software engineering thing right so again do remember there are two components which are very important for model monitoring one is the practice so one is the practice of doing it which includes uh, theory as to how to do it what to do it and so on and so forth plus the code part how do you implement it if you ask me this is very easy and you will see why i am saying this because this is exactly what you have um studied uh, so far uh, the tougher part is the code part because more or less you will realize that this is where you know the software engineering things comes into picture uh yes gartner <laughs> by the way i am also switching so um, you will be seeing uh, that changing very soon as well um now one of the things if you all remember for those of you who have attended my how many of you have not attended my ml op session because i know a lot of you have but let me ask a different question how many of you have not attended my ml ops session okay so for those of you who have not um, there is a there is a link of the session i think um, and heman can share the link of all the sessions i would highly request all of you uh, for those of you who have not attended it uh please attend it because you will be um you know you will be um th there's a lot of things that we have discussed there uh, which is very important for you to understand uh, a lot of things that we're going to do uh, today um don't worry it's not like you will not be able to understand anything but i would still request you to sort of go and attend that session now one of the very key defining thing that i talked about in this uh, in the sessions of ml ops so for those of you who are not sure what ml ops means it simply means machine learning operations now one of the key defining things like i was saying is that in the whole world of ml ops what you need to make sure is you need to be very good with coding um, now this is where you get slightly away from doing things in a jupyter notebook so you're going away from jupyter notebooks you're building systems you're building uh, services you're building micro architecture and you know bunch of crazy stuff um, so please don't get uh, disheartened listening to this that hey this is something beyond me uh, but take it as a challenge because all these topics require a huge amount of uh, coding um you know coding finesse that you should have that coding uh, capability so we'll see uh, more we go ahead that why am i saying this and why this is sort of important but essentially model monitoring is um as a word itself means is that you're trying to monitor the models uh, whatever models you have built uh, now you would like to sort of monitor it um and anything that you monitor the very simple reasoning behind any kind of monitoring is because you want to make sure that nothing uh, uh there's no problem that happens from a future point of view now another very important thing is why sort of monitoring comes into picture is and we'll sort of go behind a bit of a theory there um so most of you know that currently the, uh, the cycle of machine learning that we follow 
uh, goes at a very high level. This is this is nothing to do with like a a, a detail level. We'll see one very interesting uh, machine learning life cycle, which a lot of you love. Um, so if you see at a very high level, we sort of understand the problem, do the collection, validation, pre-processing, exploration, and then we sort of do kind of a deployment, which most of you still understand as, you know, just creating an API. And that's pretty much, you know, I think 80% of the industry sort of assumes. Um, and then there, there happens to be a lot many things which are beyond it, and which is what we typically refer to as the component of ML ops or the operational machine learning. Operational means that now you have to take the work that you have done uh, on Jupyter Notebook and sort of put it in a software infrastructure. So the moment it goes in a software infrastructure, this is when it will be uh, sort of consumable by people who are uh, going to sort of use it. So typically this becomes your business for whom you're solving a problem. Um, and this is why it is important also. Now, one thing which is very uh, important to understand at this point is that, is it important for a data scientist to also be a ML ops guy? Now, there is uh, ML ops as a whole is still a new field, uh, which means that as of now, there is no distinction. Um, data scientists are the people who are doing a bit of ML ops. But sooner or later, and this is something which has already uh, started to happen um, in many companies, not at a wide level, but it has sort of started happening, which is you do uh, you do see two jobs which are sort of coming up. And tell me if you guys are seeing this. One is ML engineer. And the other is, again, ML ops engineer. How many of you have started seeing these kinds of jobs on LinkedIn or any job portal? Anyone who has noticed this? So again, this is different from your data scientist, uh, your analytics positions and all those things, right? Um, so the reason this is happening is because of the same reason that we are discussing here, right? So data scientists are experts of this part of the cycle. So this is the part where all of you have uh, taken your training. Uh, this is where all of you have understood each and every end to end. Uh, but the story doesn't end there. Uh, there's a there's lot many things which are associated with this and which is where the other part, which is we can call it as part two or whatever you want to sort of call it. Uh, but this is where ML engineer, ML ops engineer or AI engineer, uh, there's a lot of different ways um, that people sort of uh, call this as. Uh, but these are those people who sort of take in a very simple language, if I have to put it, they take your data science work and put it into a uh, software infrastructure. <clears throat> you know, your typical software development uh, stuff. Now it's completely on you, like I said, uh, you might want to still stick to data science work or you might want to sort of go ahead and do the um, machine learning. Just give me one moment. All right, um, <clears throat> sorry for that. So like I said, it's completely on you whether you want to sort of uh, stick to data scientist roles um, and not sort of worry about too much software engineering stuff uh, because the this topic as well as the topic of MLOps that you uh, will study later on whenever you have time uh, does require a good amount of software engineering to be uh, learned, right? Because it, it involves a lot of coding and stuff like that. So this is pretty much what we are doing here, and one of the uh, one of the very important uh, a new kind of life cycle that, that we saw, and this is a diagram that I've used in um, in the MLOps session. So I'm pretty sure a lot of you remember this, but those of you who have not taken that session, you might not be uh, remembering this. But basically, if you see this whole question about what we are doing here. Uh, this is a more detailed and this is a more uh, true to life or true to enterprise kind of a situation where you start with a subject matter uh, expert or a business guy asking different questions and asking you to solve it. Then there's a whole set of data engineers who are working on data acquisition, data preparation, uh, feature engineering and you know things around 
things around data. Now, a lot of time people have this question and I, I can see Venkatesh actually did uh, say this, uh, do not confuse data engineers with machine learning engineers, right? These are two very different, um, these are two very different uh, uh, skill sets. Many company might not uh, do it at this point, but data engineers are very different. So data engineers are people who are basically your big data guys, you know, in a very simple term, if I have to say, these are people who know how to play with data. They know how to bring data to a data scientist. So your data might be sitting in thousands of different sources across different clouds, across different sources. And these data engineers are people who are building those pipelines uh, to bring that data to you, to help you sort of, um, you know, uh, get to a central location or a data warehousing kind of a concept. So data engineers are very different uh, uh, from that point. Now, this is where you also see a data scientist, which is sort of, again, working in conjunction with big data, uh, doing sort of feature engineering, model training, or experimentation, evaluation, and comparison. Now, this is what the previous uh, cycle was talking about. What it was not talking about is what you see towards the bottom, which is, again, three different levels. So what you see here is DevOps is essentially your ML engineer level or um, ML uh ml ops engineer these are these are people who are sort of doing those things um but these are those engineers and architects who are sort of going a bit beyond uh let me sort of quickly touch upon those basic points that we have again talked about in ml ops uh sessions um but beyond the basic cycle that we have here you do have a uh the production preparation which is figuring out the environment so for example uh, you know, which, which cloud should we run uh, the final model into? Should it be on-premise? Should it be on cloud? Should it be hybrid? Uh, what will be the risk evaluation of those things, uh, evaluation of those things? So for example, if, um, you know, let, let me take a very basic example to sort of give you a idea around it. Let's say you're a bank um, and uh, as a bank, you have, and your data scientist team has built a model that sort of does a prediction of a fraud. Now, when you sort of build that model, uh, a use case of production in that sense is essentially that how do you, where do you put this model? So ideally, if you think about it, like very logically, you would say that, hey, this model has to be online uh, connected with a POS terminal or, or any kind of credit debit system because every time somebody uses their card or any kind of transactions, it has to be at that place. So if somebody is making a transaction, my fraud model has to be there. So this is what it means by a runtime environment. So you have to figure that out. You have to connect those dots, which is, all right, this is what currently business is doing, which is doing a transaction. And that transaction has to be connected with the fraud model. And this is what it means by uh, preparation of production. Then you have the second one, which is the development to production. Development to production means that you finally, once you make the choice that, all right, uh, this model has to be online. Then you go into the level where you talk about containerization, elastic scaling, CI, CD. Now, again, I'm not going to go in detail of CI, CD because that's not something which is important at this point. Uh, but I would request all of you to go and watch the ML Ops session because I've talked in a great detail about what um, you know, CI, CD is. In fact, there's a whole, I think, half an hour uh, discussion that I did around this uh, diagram. So if somebody would like to sort of revisit the idea, please go and have a look into that session. The links are already there in the chats. Then comes the last part, which is what we are trying to understand in these two sessions. So this is the part which we are sort of going to focus on, which is uh, the monitoring and the feedback loop. So you have logging and alerting, you have drift tracking, you have performance drift and online evaluation. These are, um, these are again, things which are coming from a data scientist in coordination with the machine learning engineer or the MLOps engineer. So again, if you, if you really think about it, the reason we need to monitor anything is very simple because you're trying to make sure that the quality never suffers, right? This is pretty much why you monitor anything in life, whether it's anything personal, like if you monitor your weight and, uh, you know, if you're monitoring what you're eating every day, you're doing it because 
you want to make sure that you don't get into a disease state or you're not increasing your weight to whatever weight you want to maintain. So it's pretty much the same logic for models as well, right? So now that you have the model, you would want to make sure that they don't, um, you know, they don't sort of uh, stale in a larger context. Now, why that happens is also something we need to understand uh, from a, again, from a larger context. Now let's go ahead and uh, sort of talk about this and then I'm gonna take a quick small uh, break and then see whether everybody is on the same page or not. Now, one of the very important things that we all have observed um, quite frequently, and I'm pretty sure you will all agree with this, oops, my bad, um, is the fact that, just a minute. Um, okay. So one of the things that you have always observed, uh, which is, um, is as the time deployment of any model. So when you uh, initially, when you sort of do the modeling, uh, what happens is you have a model, which is very fresh out of your analysis. Um, and it has like a maximum business value. But as the time deployment sort of increases, so as you go ahead, you know, there's a time delta that keeps on happening. What you notice is that it sort of starts degrading in its performance. So um, again, it's it's quite subjective because you, sometimes you don't know what it means when we say things like uh, there's a degradation of the model. Uh, but we'll sort of try to reason these things as we go ahead. But the simple point is that if you do not do anything, if you just take the model and deploy it and keep it running for, let's say, six months, there is a good chance that the performance that you're going to get will sort of slightly come down. Uh, how much it comes down depends on the data and depends on the business that you're working, uh, but it definitely comes down. It's like it's a standard thing. And this is what we are trying to see that what can we do, what kind of monitorings can we do at each stage of degradation, such that that degradation never happens and you always maintain a specific uh, expected uh, output that should always happen. So rather than going down like this, you would want to make sure that you stay at a specific uh, performance that has been established. Um, and that's pretty much what the idea of monitoring as such is, right? So now that we have established what model monitoring is why do you need it uh, let me take a quick pause and then we'll go in details of theory um, any questions anything so full stack data scientist is essentially the same guy who is a combination of data scientist plus um, uh, ml ops engineering so combination of somebody who knows both software engineering as well as data science as simple as that Rohit. any question i hope things are making sense Nothing complicated so far. All right, no questions. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about certain questions which are very important. Um, and these are questions which I'm pretty sure a um, lot of you uh, might have had uh, while doing uh, production or while doing any kind of modeling for that matter. In fact, let me uh, let me know the moment we'll discuss a key question, uh, whether that sort of is something which you have observed um, uh, observed in your case when you were doing modeling, right? Uh, one of the question which uh, Simon Ohar is asking is how long before the degradation becomes significant. Um, that's where I said that this is very subjective. This is where you from your business and your data would have to sort of um, think about it and see which what degradation makes uh, more sense to you. So maybe 2% is not a big thing for you, but it might be a very big thing for, let's say, um, uh, for a bank. Uh, so it completely depends. So when there are a lot of subjectivity, we need to, again, fall down to basic practices, basic theory. So that, that is why I said that model monitoring is a combination of theories and practices, a good kind of questions along with the code. And that's what we are trying to establish in these two sessions, which is I'm going to give you a lot of questions that you can keep in your mind 
a lot of practices and theories that you can keep in your mind which will help you then design those infrastructures later with either with the help of software engineering team or if you're good at doing it on your own you can do it on your own right all right so let's start with certain key questions which are very important um the first one starting with the first one is what are uh, or why are there sudden changes in the values of my feature now this is a very common thing which happens which is let's start with the basic premise when we do machine learning do we do machine learning on historical data or do we do machine learning on present data so there are two two sets of data right so one is a historical data in the color so one is historical and then let's call something else as a future data so future includes the present and anything that comes in the future so we all know this like the very basic premise that all modelings that we do uh, are essentially on the historical data now is it a fair assumption that all the future data is always going to be exactly like the historical data do you think that is correct or do you think that's wrong right so most of you i'm pretty sure all of you will say no to this so historical and future like if you it might so happen that you're very lucky let's let's not call it as 100% um let's just say that there there is a slight likelihood that it might happen but in majority of the cases do we all agree that historical data never equals to a future data like again we are saying we're talking probabilistically here so let's say 90 99 or 98% this is going to be true right which is the historical data will never be equal to a future data now if this is the case which is going to happen how are you going to hold the same performance of the model because your models are built on historical they don't understand the slight changes which are happening day on day basis or month on month so this is where the first key question comes in that the sudden changes in the values of your features how how are you addressing that i hope everybody understands the premise of this so the very first question that we need to understand is why are there certain feature changes which are happening and the moment you understand this question what you have to remember is that this is what we refer to as data distribution changes so this is what you then tend to monitor you see the questions what we are asking and the question that we're going to discuss will lead to kind of a metric or a practice that you have to monitor is this point making sense to all of you okay uh tavish let's come back to the question i think what you are saying is that it's not always true that the historical is not equal to future is that correct what you are saying yeah and I, like i said uh, it depends but majority of the use cases that you'll do in the industry uh, 98 to 99% will always be uh, not equal to historical not equal to this but there are going to be uh, places where uh, this will not uh, hold true, right so like i already said that um, so we are only talking about things where this doesn't hold true right so again what is that we need to monitor we need to monitor again our reference points are historical so this is our historical and this is a future so what is that you need to do you need to find the delta between history and the future now it could be any kind of delta it could be a very significant delta or it could not be a delta which is sort of of any importance but more or less what we need to think about is that that's the first thing that we need to um, sort of address now the second thing is who owns the model in production the devops team the engineers the data scientists now this is another question which is very important um what do you guys think is is there a ownership that has to be there with the models 
So Ankur has a good point. Um, let's come back to this point right after we address this point. So my question to all of you is, do you, why do you think ownership of the model is important? Or you think that it, it's not important? So some of you are saying yes, um, ownership of any module is always necessary. Correct. So the thing is, um, somebody has to own the model, right? Because unless there is an accountability associated with this, you won't be able to sort of address the issues that are going to crop up later. Because what is going to happen, and this is something which is so uh, so basic, is that unless and until we have an accountable person or a team, what will then happen is that later, if something goes wrong, uh, all the included stakeholders will start fighting, right? So the DevOps team will say, hey, you model guys are not doing things properly or your engineer guys are not doing things properly. So this is another thing which is, you know, sort of very important for you to understand that whenever you do model productions, one of the very key things that you need to understand is that you need to give ownership to the models ownership of the model to a certain specific team. So it could be a data scientist, it could be a DevOps. In majority cases, it is going to be part of data scientist team. Um, and the most, and in most cases, it also happens that there's a joint ownership between data scientist and DevOps team, because DevOps team is making sure that the model is going to be part of uh, the production. But the major ownership, and when we say ownership, it's not like, um, they just own it. The reason we are saying that the data scientists need to own it is because if something goes wrong from a technical or a mathematical or, or a learning point of view, uh, it has to make sense uh, uh, or it has to make sense for a data scientist or so data scientists need to make sure that all of these issues are resolved yeah, before going to production. Now, coming back to a very interesting uh, question that Anrag uh, said, which is, um, hey, while this makes sense that historical and future will, most of the cases will not be sort of similar, but one of the very key defining features that we have learned over the years is that machine learning models are built to generalize on unseen data. Anybody who can sort of answer that, that if that is true, then why are we saying that there's an issue when there's a difference in the future? Anybody who would like to sort of answer this? All right, a lot of people have, okay. So data, data is corrupted, okay. So again, let's try to understand this in a very simple way. See what under uh, what we were trying to understand. What that point basically meant was very simple. See, do you do you all agree that when we say that the historical data is what we essentially use to do a model prediction, that historical data gets divided into train and test, right? Or some cases they do uh, validation and eval set and all that. But let's just take a simple uh, variation, which is uh train and test now when we say the unseen is this unseen coming from the test data or is this unseen coming from a future data so the unseen word that we use which is to un it should be able to generalize into the unseen that unseen is coming from a test data and when you and and think like very literally, so when you have to prove a generalization, see when we use a word like it has to generalize well on unseen, it by default means that you're talking about test data because in test data you know the why prediction. Do you guys agree with this? So you you only know when something is going to generalize only when you have a why value where you can sort of measure the difference. Do you guys agree with this? And this is where the difference between the future data. So what typically happens in such cases is that while we want it to generalize on the unseen data, what we are saying is that this unseen data is still coming from the historical point of view. It's not again from a future point of view because more or less 
more or less, and I'm not sort of saying this um, from a hundred percent point, I'm saying more or less the future data will not have the Y value. Do we all agree on this? The future data will not have the Y value, correct? That's where it becomes very hard. Correct. So the whole point of this production machine learning and why we do monitoring and why it is sort of so hard and why it is so subjective is do we all agree on this fact that the reason it gets tricky and the reason it gets tough is because the future data, you don't have the Y value. You do have the X, which is your features and the, the columns that you're using. But what you don't have is the Y value. So you have no way of knowing whether your models are doing you know, your models are doing good or bad or what's happening. So you have no visibility into that. So now I hope everybody is sort of slowly understanding, um, uh, you know, sort of the premise of what we are discussing and why these questions are important to understand. So when we say that the, the difference between historical and future, so again, in a very simple term, you can say that there are two, uh, two comparisons that we do. So X with X and Y with Y right so x of historical and x of future and y of historical and y of future does does that make sense this these two uh or let's just say four comparison now you might say that hey lovey you just said that we don't have y of future but we'll see how we address that as well right but do we all agree so when we say we need to monitor a, a monitor there are many things we monitor but the data distribution changes that we are referring here is only with respect to the X, right? This is with respect to the X, whether there is a change in those, um, uh, those values or not. So far, so good guys, any question? Let me take a pause. Anything which is not making sense or anything which is, all good. Okay, perfect. Now let's uh, let's go ahead um, and see a bit more questions, which are sort of uh, going to be um, uh, going to be very important. And again, always see the key questions are always followed by a standard keywords or what we are going to refer to as standard keyword inside the world of monitoring, right? So, like I said, the first is distribution change. The second is ownership and production. Now the third question is, the key question is, why is the model giving poor results in production despite our rigorous testing and validation attempts during development? Now see, again, there is a difference. This is, this is a very basic premise where you built a model on your Jupyter notebook, dividing your historical data into train test and all of those things. And you got good results. You did like very extensive testing. You did cross validation. You did you did every damn possible thing that is uh, that is there in the uh, machine learning uh, kitty. Now, once you do that, and then you did the production, and then suddenly somebody the business starts telling you, "Hey guys, uh, we are not getting good results. Um, there's something going wrong." This is what we mean as a standard word called as training serving skew. Because what is happening is your production is still not doing good. Why? Because your historical and the future data somehow doesn't fit very well. Correct? I hope this point is clear. Yes. So slides will be uh, given. Oh, I didn't give you for the previous. Is it? Okay. I will. if the data collection process was not correct. So again, see, this is uh, what we are sort of talking about here is very simple. What we are saying is that on your Jupyter notebook, you were very happy, you got very good results, but on production. So again, always think about these two keywords, historical data and future data. Historical data has both the component of X and Y, future data only has X. So what we are seeing in training serving skew is that the moment you go on production and your business is finally making a product like, let's take an example. Okay. 
how do we know because now somebody will say uh, like sujit is asking hey how do you know that uh, uh, the model in production is performing good or not so let's take an example uh, the the same example of uh, fraud prediction so let's say you took uh, banks data for last 5 years um, of the fraud and non fraud so last 5 years historical data you know what is fraud and what is not fraud you did the best of machine learning you did auto ml you did uh, crazy models you did feature engineering so you did everything and you reached to a point where you are getting very comfortable uh, f1 ratios or you are getting very comfortable recalls and all of those things correct now once you do that you basically say to your business that hey we are getting very good results and we are quite confident that this is what is going to happen and then you sort of put this model in production now what happens is uh, typically on an average let's assume this is again from a business point of view on an average the uh, business receive when the model was not on production business was receiving let's say five calls a day for frauds that's what's happening currently the moment they put your model in production suddenly the five calls got increased to let's say 15 calls per day so what is happening can somebody tell me what might be happening now so there is no why which is coming as such but there was one thing that the business was tracking which is the number of calls that they received every day so what might be going wrong anybody who can guess so dinesh we'll address that towards the end can you put it in a q and a so let me let me again put the question back so what i'm saying is let's say uh, the bank uh, uh, added the model in the production um, and this model is basically uh, trying to um, you know this model is trying to get the uh, fraud prediction and before the model was in the in the uh, prediction uh, sorry in the production what is happening is that we were only getting five calls per day uh the five calls per day got increased to 15 calls per day so my question was what could be causing this any guesses so model is not performing okay good model is not predicting well or there might be more false positives uh model is unable to distinguish fraud calls data variant so okay do you all agree that there is something which is wrong correct it could be distribution of the data it could be um it could be that your model is sort of slightly not behaving the way it was supposed to be and the one of the reason the bigger reason would be that your data might have suddenly started shifting to what it was supposed to be correct so do we all agree that the moment you see a increase in whatever metric that you are measuring because we we agree that there is no why correct so the why is not there which means that when you have to do this you have to make sure that 15 calls per day means that there's some, so there's a big change in the data the underlying data of it right the input change that was used for model change in new fraud patterns correct so uh, one of the point which is also very val uh, valid which I, uh, which i think somebody said which is evolving fraudsters right so evolving frauds uh, fraudsters essentially means that um it's so true it happens by the way it's it's so true because sometimes what happens is the fraudsters are also seeing what kind of activity they do that gets flagged by the uh, by the bank so they stop doing it and then they they start doing something else they figure out some new thing uh, which takes a uh, business or which takes the bank a bit more time to uh, adapt to those things you see and these are all the problems on the other hand if this was reduced to let's say three calls per day or let's say two calls per day then we would have said that hey you know what this is good because nothing is uh, behaving bad or good so do you all now understand a very basic premise that in problems which are supervised learning we, we are not even talking about unsupervised learning we are being very specific to supervised learning the basic premise of the problem is that once something goes in production there is a very different behavior that might come out of it why because you're going to sort of do a prediction on the x you don't know what the y is so you have no idea what the y is which means you have to track something else something else could be 
in the case that we took an example it could be calls that the bank receives every day for the fraud that's a very good uh, metric to do that but this is where you have to sit with your business and figure out what is it i'm going to measure so there are two ways of doing it one is you always uh, can figure out a indirect metric which indirectly tells you how your models are performing or you can sort of proactively do the model uh, sorry the data labeling part right so now let's understand what the data labeling part means is everything clear so far any questions before we move to the next idea so is everybody clear that when you are in a supervised learning environment you have to figure out a business metric which is indirect business metric which gives you a sense of how your model might be performing correct i hope this is making sense can somebody give me a, a good example of that so i gave you uh, one example of fraud where measuring the calls that the call center receives for the fraud can be measured can somebody give me something else so let's let me give you a use case and you tell me what will be the indirect metric that you will use so let's say we built a model to predict covid uh, of a person so given their let's say they do a uh, they do a blood test and the blood test report goes to our model and it gives you whether you're going to have a covid or not now obviously unless somebody goes for an rt pcr or uh, all those basic tests we don't know whether uh, that prediction was correct or not can there be any other indirect way of measuring how our uh, model might be perform uh, performing in this case anybody who can think of it any indirect way of medical so medical history were on uh, anyway taking to do the prediction of covid but now we are just getting the medical history and we we have no way unless the patient itself tells you that hey i have gone through rt pcr uh, and it seems like i i do have a covid okay so let let me repeat the question so let's say we all built a model to do a prediction of covid how did we build the model what data did we use we used the blood reports or medical history of a patient and then from that we said um that uh, okay this person will get covid now this person has so far not gone to rt pcr test because for some reason the person might not be uh, feeling anything uh, or no symptom is there so the person doesn't know whether they have covid but you predicted in such cases when your models are predicting on a future data or on a data which is sort of um um uh, a new data how are you going to then track the results of it so some um track patients surrounding covid results uh, if in the area we have active cases and the symptoms are same as covid okay if false negatives are more uh the spread will increase if a person is smoking or have breathing problems uh connected problems okay demographic of the patient how many of them have covid symptoms um okay good so so the thing is what we're going to do is we are trying to figure out the indirect way of addressing whether our model are doing a good thing or not so in this case also you can sort of do a lot of things so for example a lot of you are saying that hey um maybe we should see that the person for whom we are sort of doing a prediction let's check the location of that person and in that location see how many cases are we getting if you suddenly start seeing more cases it might be a proof that your models are performing well because your models are also saying the same thing that hey in this uh, area a lot of people are going to be covid positive right again coming back to the core point do we all understand what we are talking here the main point is that historical data and the future data has a very different distinction historical has x and y future has only x there is no y so you have to do some indirect way of measuring it i hope this is a key point that everybody understands 
So let's take another uh, another use case which is Surendra has suggested, which is telecom churn. So again, assume that you took five years of data and you figured out a model which can predict if a consumer is going to churn or not. How would you then measure in the live scenario or in the future data whether your models are doing good or bad? What is that indirect metric or indirect uh, thing that you will measure? which will tell you whether your models are performing the way you expected them to be. If the per day call reduces, good, good. Reduction in recharge, that is also good. So one of the very key defining ways is very similar to what we saw with the uh, fraud cases. So if you measure the number of calls that you receive every day and suddenly the call sort of goes down, it means that you are actively taking care of those people. Now, see, it's slightly more business because what you're saying is that the reason the calls will come down is because you might have already predicted that, for example, uh, uh, Jessel and Aruna might be leaving. So you're already proactively taking care of those uh, people. So now they are not even calling you. And hence, you can say, okay, my models are performing the way it is, right? So again, key point, very important that the metric that we talk about while we train a model, your F1 recall precision, they may or may not work in the live case scenario. Correct? Do we all agree on this point? Anybody who disagrees with this? Or have or anybody who has a counterpoint to this? So the metrics of model evaluations while you, while you do the training is different metrics which you have to figure out on the live data has to be slightly different correct so far so good okay now sometimes do you all also agree that hey lovey okay fine as a theory it makes sense as a logic it makes sense um but it's it's also very subjective and it's also very tough for you to sort of always figure out an indirect way correct Do we all agree on this also? I mean, as a theory and a logic, it makes sense. But then you'll be like, hey, you know what? Maybe some use cases we might figure out, but things are not that mature. Uh, it's not always going to be a one-on-one -on -one comparison because you're still doing indirect. And how are you going to measure that? What reduction means? Or, or, so for example, if you're seeing uh, five calls increase to 15 calls, and you have to do a separate analysis to say whether these five to 15 increase is happening because of the model or is it happening because of something else that is happening so you see how this could be a challenge correct there could be a lot of things that you might have to end up uh, doing it so there is an alternative so again i'm not saying that uh, let's just get rid of it and let's just do something else Ultimately, what works for you and your business and the data that you're working is something that you have to figure out. It could be a hybrid of both the approaches that we're going to see, or it could be one of the either. But the point is there is an alternate approach. The alternate approach is very simple to think about. Tell me this. We don't have Y of the future data, but can we not tag a Y? So for example, the new future data, every day you're getting, let's say, 1 million records of which you're doing a prediction. I'm taking a very conservative and a very larger case. Let's say every day you're getting 1 million records and your model predicts something out of it. And every day, this is the frequency. Don't you all agree that we can actually take, let's say, 2% of this and then we train a team who can just do a labeling of this data? from the business and say, all right, this 2% out of 1 million, um, I'm going to manually label what the actual answer should be so that then I can very easily compare all the results. Does, does that, is it making sense? Okay, let's take an example. So, oh, sorry, let me... Just give me one moment. Okay. So what we are basically saying is, um, if let's say every day you're getting 
you know, 1 million records, right? So you got 1 million records. Now, what we are saying is take one or 2%. And again, this is very subjective. I'm just saying that maybe every day you take 100 or 1000 records, some, somewhere in that uh, range. Have a team, you know, you can sort of create a team of uh, data entry people whom you can give a business sense or business uh, training and tell them that, hey, can you please go through each of these 100 or 1000 records and manually label label as in whatever the uh, labels that you were predict predicting which means that they are giving you a business driven why of these data now of this data then you can simply compare it with your historical data this is what i meant by another approach that could be possible in this case does does that make sense oops Right. So all you're telling is data annotation should be done on the live data once deployed. Correct. Absolutely. That's it. as simple as that. Um, it will add overhead of continuous labeling support uh, during production. Is there any other way? We'll talk about the issues with this logic, right? So as of now, let's just discuss the logic. We'll talk about the issues and challenges. Um, but do we all agree with the approach? The approach simply means that the new data or the future data that we are getting, we take some handful of it. Uh, that is, again, your choice. You can take very small, you can take very large, depending upon the bandwidth of the team. Also, do note, this is, this is not something as a data scientist you will start doing, right? So in most cases, what happens is business basically sets up a team. This team could comprise of, um, you know, data entry people or some somebody like that. And they will then train them to sort of figure out, okay, this is what, if, if you get a data like this, it means this, or if you do get a data like this, this is what it means, right? So that is your second approach. Second approach uh, essentially does the data labeling, correct? Is the approach clear to all of you? I hope nobody has any issues with the approach. We'll talk about the issues with the approach, right? So some of you are saying, hey, this is very expensive. Some of you are saying um, it's a huge overhead and things like that, right? Um, but how do we assure that the labels are right? This is where your business comes into picture, Poona. So um, you are not, that, that's why I said that it is not a data scientist's job to label it. It is your business. So for example, your operational people in a bank who know every day in, day out what a fraud is, do you agree that they are the best people to make it, uh, to tell you what is a fraud and what is not a fraud? Correct? So it's the same thing. Now, does that mean that it uh, it is going to be 100% accurate, like whatever the business guys are saying, it is going to be 100% accurate? Absolutely not. You're just taking a fair assumption. You're saying that, okay, maybe if I'm labeling 100 data points every day, there is a good chance that I'm going to have a 2% error or a 3% error. Correct? I hope this makes sense. So I'm not saying that if you do manual label, it is going to be hundred percent accurate. You are assuming already that there's going to be 1% or 2% error, or in some cases, maybe a bit more, but you are doing it only because you're trying to make sure that I do have a way to address the monitoring part. The monitoring part being that how do I quantitatively say that something that I've done is good or bad. Correct. In fact, for those of you who have uh, who have tried losing weight, do you all agree that you exactly do the same thing, which is you quantify everything? And it's very hard because sometimes you're like, for most people, this is why losing weight is hard because it's very subjective to quantify how many calories to eat, what carbs you need to eat, what proteins you need to eat. And this is why we go to a nutritionist, right? So in that case also, if you think about it for a moment, it is not 100% accurate. It's not that if your nutritionist says that, hey, you need to take 25 grams of this and you basically go and take something and it is exactly 25 grams, right? We all know this. 
but more or less if you follow that in a very rough approximation where it where a nutritionist says that hey you are supposed to take 200 uh, 2000 calories a day in which this is what uh, this is how much protein should be there this is how much carb should be there you roughly sort of follow that and a lot of people do get benefits out of it right so we can't say hey no but you were 3 uh, grams above the uh, allotted this and that but ultimately you know um, you get to achieve whatever you're trying to do because the the science works the overall science works right the cheat days would be kpi correct so j- just like that we are doing a very similar thing uh, when it comes to model so we are saying that hey we don't know exactly how to measure it but we'll come up with more approximate ways of doing it so what people this is why i said initially that um you know people tend to do more uh, more hybrid way where what they do is they come up with a business metric so they are also measuring that they also what uh, they also start doing manual annotations by setting up a team and then you know sort of uh, measuring and then uh, seeing the difference between the results and they do these things in combination to make sure that whatever whatever is being pushed to production is performing the way they expected it right now like i said and like most of you pointed out that hey uh, manual labeling is expensive yes it is but things are now in you know nowadays um there are a lot of companies which have come up with sort of uh does this on your behalf so there are companies in india uh whose job is just to make sure that you tell them that hey this is what we want you to tag for us uh, and this is the rule and then they have the bandwidth of people so they help you do uh, those things right so i don't know how many of you know this do you guys know this that there are a lot of companies in india which actually are built over data uh, annotation okay good so not just in india by the way china is becoming a great country to do that just like with everything china and uh, there's a word which is associated with this which is called as data tagging factories if those of you are like very interested search google uh, by this which is data a factory or data tagging factories and what is happening in this is basically you reach out to these factories um and you basically tell them that hey uh, th- these are bunch of thousands and millions of records and this is what we want you to tag this is a business rule um can you please uh, help us do that aws also has mechanical turk correct absolutely um azure also has something very similar so while all of us might some of us might think that hey this is very out of the box and this is something which will require a huge uh, money but trust me it is becoming very cheap and it is also becoming very important for people to uh, um uh, very important for people to uh, sorry very important for enterprises to do that do you want to know a very good example of this how many of you saw very recently ai tesla days anybody who saw that in fact i did post the link on uh, on the group uh, the telegram group that we have anybody who saw that completely <laughs> not many so rajesh did but if you have not seen uh, so this is something which is very interesting uh, also so what you what i want all of you to go ahead and do is go to youtube and just search for tesla ai day right just search for it um okay so if anybody who can send the telegram group uh, that we are all part of um i don't have but i think somebody can so anyway uh, tesla as you all know uh, runs a car which is a tesla car and one of the most interesting feature of that car is something which we say autopilot right i, I hope this everybody knows right tesla has a feature which is what we refer to as autopilot which can drive itself now do you know how tesla creates a training data so if you think about this problem there are two bigger issues one that they need to have a huge training data which is to say that all the driving data that they need to have and the second is when the cars are in production or let's just say cars when they are um uh cars when they are on road they need to sort of uh check whether whatever their models are doing is correct or not so 
if you really want to see the live way of how they are handling it, please go and watch Tesla AI Day. Uh, you will get to see how these people are doing exactly the same thing, which is they have a data tagging, uh, uh, they have a data labeling concept, and they, there's a huge team that sort of helps them do it. Uh, but a lot of companies are doing it. So they are sort of coming up with their own way of labeling things. They're also coming up with their own uh, teams, which are also doing it in a more intelligent fashion rather than completely manually. So it's also not completely uh, manual, just to sort of give you a context. Uh, there's a lot of automation and there's a lot of models that happens in the same, um, uh, in the same sense, right? Uh, let me see if somebody shares the link of telegram or else i'll do that towards the end okay all right so we are done with three now, now let's go ahead and talk about the last uh, sorry not the last uh, the other questions which is very important let me okay now there's a reverse of it so what we just saw is that everything uh, performs well in my development, but nothing performs well in production. There's a reverse of it, which is what we refer to as model or a concept drift, which is, was my model performing well in production? Suddenly the performance dipped over time. This is what we were talking about. Uh, you know, this is what we were talking about. Um, the dip that is going to happen. So a standard name for that, that we use is model or a concept drift. Drift, we all understand what drift means. Anything that goes uh, slightly away from the expected is what we refer to as drift. And model or a concept drift essentially means that how over the time certain things sort of drifts away. So this is what we what we mean by model and concept drift. The next key question is how can I interpret and explain my model prediction in line with the business objective and to relevant stakeholders? Now, do you guys remember that we already have a session with this? So my last session, I'm not sure if uh, how many of you attended. I know a lot of you did, um, people who did attend the last session. Um, again, for those of you who didn't, please attend, uh, please see the recording of models, which essentially talks about this key concept, which is when you do complicated models, how do you explain it? In fact, in that session, I did show you um, I actually showed you how you can sort of query each and every uh, uh, records uh, using SHAP. And we saw uh, 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 we saw actually a very good open source uh, project called Shaple, um, which sort of can explain a lot of results, which, which can explain what is causing it to come this, what is causing it to come to the other way, right? So again, uh, there is an Excel which is maintained, and I think uh, Hemant has shared it initially. You can actually go to that and in that there's a session called interpretable models. Please have a look into it. That essentially talks about it. Uh, so Aruna has shared. Thank you, Aruna. The second key concept is how can I ensure the security of my model? Is my model being attacked? Now, this is what we refer to as adversarial attacks. Adversarial attacks essentially means, again, let's take a very simple answer uh, scenario to understand this. If you remember very uh, few moments back, we were discussing about that when you have a model which is doing fraud prediction, the people on the other, uh, other side, which are basically people who are doing frauds, they are also smart because they are also now seeing that, hey, if I do the same thing, I'm being flagged. So let me do a, a different thing. This is what we mean by adversarial attacks on models. So what happens is, if you have trained a model to identify cat versus dog and somebody figures that out that this is what is happening with your uh, model and then they can actually do something with the uh, image which can fool your models, right? Now, let me ask a basic question. When you build a model, do you all agree that you can actually fool your model? Do you guys think you can fool your models? And when I say fool, I'm basically saying that if I were to pass a data, which is very, um, very confusing. And I know for the fact that this will always be given a specific class, which it is not. And this is what it means by adversarial attacks. 
now this is again a evolving uh, field uh, not lot many things have been talked about it but do you guys at least agree that this is one of the most important aspect again that if you do not do a thorough testing of your models if you don't secure your model to make sure of uh, uh, you know what could be the adversaries or what could be the adversaries in case of the new data then it will be very challenging situations right and this is which uh, this is what it comes under ai ethics so again session in in the ml sessions we have talked this essentially means all of these things that if you're doing certain things like this as prediction what we do to address the adverse that might happen Later on, because unless matters with the model when you data science area, do you do you struggle with the trust issues with the business? Even though you're building good models, even though you're building great models, I would say, do you still feel the trust issues in your company? uh sir sorry to interrupt you uh, your voice is kind of breaking is it better no, now no 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 it is still breaking you we can't hear you at all how about now getting Is better it yeah it's better now uh, give me one moment right um i think now my so is my voice okay now yes yes much better okay perfect all right so what i was asking um sorry i lost the chain of thoughts uh, anybody who can tell me with the question that i was asking trust issues <laughs> i seem to have a trust issue with my network though um and and i think somebody did uh, share the link of the group as well so if uh, money did share the group link so people can join that uh, if they want to all right so my question was that how many of you have faced the trust issues with your businesses um when it comes to when you do models and when you uh, put something in production do you, do you face that issue big yes jaisal is like big yes <laughs> tavish is also a lot right and you see why this is happening because do you see the gray areas which are sort of there um because we don't talk or think and address the issues beyond the models right do you guys now see why it is so important for us to sort of learn and understand these things and I, and i get it a lot of you might be sort of uh, slightly furiated because you're like hey there's too much theory too much theory and this is why i sort of set the agenda at the very starting that this is going to be a lot of theories because there is no set way or there's no set algorithm which will help you address all of this in one go it's a bunch of practice it's a bunch of different questions that we need to be aware of in fact one of the very common philosophical saying is that if you know what the problem is half of the problem is already solved it's exactly like that sometimes you're not even aware of the issues so what we are trying to understand by doing these discussions is what is the issue why are we um sort of discussing this right so these are all which is going to establish a trust level with your business 
the more you try to address them um, by doing certain things, right? A very thin line in, uh, in defining the scope of the model while testing the scope limitations is slightly pushed by customer. Yes, and, and you see, this is this is one of the very defining, um, a defining moment of your discussions with the businesses or the client, right? Because your clients are also not very mature. For them, it's like, just give us the model. Correct, Jessel? Do you agree with this? Like, it's not even something they are also discussing. So it's, it, it becomes a more challenging problem because a we are also not aware as a data scientist they are also not aware for them they just come to you and say hey uh, here is the data give us the model it should be 90 percent accurate and then you'll be like okay fine i'll do that and then we start thinking and discussing all of this and we're like oh shit this is not possible because <clears throat> even though i can give you 90 percent accurate data which is again star mark um there could be so many things which could go wrong and which your client might have not even thought about. So your client might be thinking that hey, it might just take three, uh, three months or six months. But in reality, the production and the ML ops operational part and all of this that we are discussing might actually take one year. Do you guys agree with this? <laughs> right. So, so has, has a conclusive point out of all of this. What we are doing at this moment, and this is going to be, uh, let me sort of, uh, you know, give you a bit of motivation. See, the thing is, after five years down the line, this all will become very streamlined. Like you will have like 10 things and a bunch of crazy tools and everything will be automated. That is going to happen maybe five years down the line. At this point, it's not there, which means maybe we just need to uh, learn it the hard way. Like I learned machine learning the hard way compared to you people. So that's pretty much what you all are at this point doing. Also, what is more important is once we understand all of this, it is your duty to make sure to bring these things up during your next discussions, right? So while your client might come to you or your business might come to you and say the same thing like Jessel is saying that, hey, give us a model which is 90% accurate. We don't care about anything. You please make sure that you start initiating these discussions, which is, hey, sure, we can do this. How are you going to uh, address the post model accuracies? How are you going to address the monitoring part? What is that you're going to monitor? So and so forth, right? So start having these discussions because it's going to make your as well as your client life much easier and much better, which also means towards the end, you get to retain your job for a longer time. You also get to get more promotions towards the end. So that is why these things are sort of slightly important for us to understand. So now that we have um, sort of understood these things, uh, the last part is model readiness, which is how will I compare result from a newer version of my model? against the in-production versions, right? This is again, um, yes, Puna, so there are, uh, and we're gonna go uh, into those things. So like I said, before we go into the solutions, we first need to identify all the problems, right? That's why I sort of figured out the key question, then the specific names and then the solution. So now what is going to happen, at least in your case, um, you know, at least for the session that we are taking, you have a question in your mind, you know the exact key phrase that is used to address uh, address that. And then we'll also figure out certain solutions. So at least you have a good understanding of the whole scenario. Does, does that make sense, Poorna? Perfect, perfect. So Tavish, there are, there are a few more, uh, not just seven, so there are a few more. There are, I think, four more in the next slide. Okay, so let's go there uh, step by step. So how will I compare results from a newer versions of my model against uh, the introduction version? Again, this has to do with how many of you remember the ML flow? Anybody who remembers ML flow? What is that we used to do with ML flow? Correct. Some of you do. So for those of you who don't know what ML flow is, ML flow is a machine learning, um, machine learning experiment tracking, uh, open source, uh, software or 
tool, you can say. What it does is it's a very interesting tool where it tracks every damn thing that you do in machine learning. As simple as that. Let's take a more simplistic way of understanding it. We all know that when we do machine learning, starting with parameters, models, uh, uh, you know, different uh, properties uh, and all of those things. There's so many moving parts, right? So what MLflow helps you do is it helps you track all of those things. That's pretty much what MLflow does. Now, this is also a very important question, which is how will I compare results of newer versions, which is, see, you all have to understand this, that while we have a metric of machine learning model, which measures recalls and precisions we also need to also understand the business impact of each and everything right this is what the seventh question essentially says which is if i'm changing the model uh with the new data which is coming in how does it affect overall business as well as the overall thing so this is what we refer to as model readiness that how ready our models are it's it's not just that you keep on training keep on training but how ready do you get to these uh different aspects of it and this is what we mean by model readiness now let's quickly see some of the more questions so there are four more so total you have 11 points now uh and this is good enough there are many more by the way um but it's good enough for you to sort of have these discussions um going forward in your organization the um, eighth question is, why does my training pipeline fail when executed? Why does a retraining job take so long to run? Now, this is more or less like an engineering problem. This has nothing to do with as such model model per se, but it is more to do with that. You know, it's, it's a very simple way of understanding that your model pipeline, when we say pipelines, each and every step that you took in your Jupyter notebook works wonderfully well end to end. However, when you put this as a script or a pipeline on a production, a lot of things don't seem to work the way they were working on Jupyter Notebook. So one of the things that we always remember or one of the things that we always think about is that Jupyter Notebook is not production. So in production, you might end up writing scripts or what we typically refer to as pipelines. Now, whenever you hear a word pipeline, for those of you who are not aware of it, it's a very simple process. So let, let me give you an example of a pipeline. This is a pipeline. You take a data, um, remove outlier, remove column, remove something. Let's say you're also doing removal of something then train test split and then let's say some model right so if you see that these are all steps step one step two step three so these are all the steps which is pretty much what you do in uh in your jupyter notebook right so if i take all of this and i put all of them as a function now imagine that for all of this i have a function Right. So the way you do function is basically you write def remove outlier, right? So R O and then you take a data and then you return a data. That's what I mean by uh, function. So you take a data, you call a function, you call a function, you call a function, you call a function. So basically I've sort of converted everything into functional uh, approaches. Again, for those of you, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure most of you who attended the MLOps, you will be able to relate very well to it. For those of you who don't, please uh, see the sessions of MLOps. I have actually shown you a bunch of different examples of doing this. So this is what we mean by pipeline. So when, my, when we say that the training pipelines fail, we are essentially saying that these bunch of steps that we did in Jupyter Notebook, you know, in cells and all of those things worked wonderfully well for us. But the moment we went to production, things sort of doesn't work the way they were working in the Jupyter Notebook. And that's another a uh, big issue that you have to sort of figure out, which is what we refer to as pipeline health issues or pipeline uh, issues in general. The ninth question is why is the latency of my predictive service very high? Why am I getting vastly varying latency for my different models? So the word latency here is very simple. See, it's like this. When you build a model um, and when you send 1000 records, let's take a simple example. When you send 1000 records to your model, 
let's say took 2 milliseconds to respond this is this is something which is happening in um in your jupiter notebook now when you scale this up suddenly what started happening is this 2 millisecond time is what we are referring to as latency latency simply means that when you send something to the model and then the model responds back with the answer how much latency do you have now here's a quick question do you want higher latencies or do you want lower latencies of your models we want lower very simple right now if i have 4 gb machine which is currently giving me 2 millisecond response time or 2 millisecond um 2 millisecond uh, latency i want to reduce it to much lower value what will i do again very simple question what will i do now i have a 4 gb machine 4 gb ram machine which is currently giving me 2 millisecond response time correct so most of you will say hey just increase the ram you will see a slight increase so it's not like if you do 8 gb suddenly you'll have one uh, millisecond so what we all understand very clearly is that if you have a better machine both in terms of ram and the uh, uh, the processor that it has your uh, latencies might decrease or there's another thing that you all know very well do you agree that if I shift from CPU to GPU, do you all agree that you'll have way, way faster latencies because GPUs are way faster? Correct? So any which way, it's not that simple, by the way. I'm trying to make it sound very simple, but it's not that simple. But you all understand the basic concept, right? So what you always have to discuss with the business is this point, which is what is the latency that they expect? out of the model what is the production scenario latency that they expect a discussion typically goes like this so let's say Avesh is my business guy and I'm, he has asked me to uh, you know build a model uh, with 90 percent accuracy and everything so all the other um, risk factors have already had a discussion with him the next question that I'll be putting up to him would be this that hey Avesh um, how do you imagine a production what is the frequency and the velocity of the data that is going to come and what do you expect the latency to be when this frequency and velocity comes so avish might say that hey lavi you know what um, every second we're going to get like 10000 records and whole day we're going to get let's say some millions of records and i want you to be under 4 milliseconds that could be something that your business might know or it, they might not so you have to work either way. So don't assume that they will always know. But this is a very important discussion that you need to have. Why? Because let me ask you another quick question. If you have two models, model one, which is logistic, and the model two, which is, let's say, um, Exiboost, right? So logistic and Exiboost. Which model gives you faster prediction? Again, let me be very careful here. I'm not asking in terms of um, training because training, we all know Exiboost will take time. I am asking which model take, or which model will give me faster predictions. So a lot of you, some of you are saying logistics, some of you are also saying Exiboost. So by the way, um, if you were to use CPU, logistic will give you faster predictions. If you were to use Exiboost on GPU, Exiboost will give you way, way faster prediction. Now, do you slowly understand why this is a very important question to ask to a business? Because if your business is having some basic idea of latency and they are saying, no, we want to keep it less than uh, this millisecond or something like this, then your choice of modeling will also slightly shift because then you can't do very complicated ensemble modelings. You then have to stick to standard models where you have maybe GPU support or maybe have faster predictions. Uh, do you see what I'm trying to say here? At the same time, this is one of the important question uh, also goes in the training format as well. So once you have... Um, 
uh, faster prediction. Sometimes you also want faster trainings as well. So maybe your business is saying that, hey, we will get the data and I want you to retrain the model every day, uh, something like that. So in that case, also, you have to think about what is that I need to do from a training point of view, right? So let me take a pause before we uh, address the last two points. Uh, Arjun, this is about the inference time, right? How does quantization help? So inference time, yes. So the, what we mean by prediction time is essentially also the other word for that is inference. Uh, the quantization helps in the deep learning world, Arjun. So what happens is um, there are certain, so if you remember in deep learning, we do have, um, uh, data, which is like most of the time they are numbers because they are, um, they are images, there are, they, they are pictures, videos, and all that each pixel values, uh, can take a floating point number, which could be a 16 floating point or a 32 bit floating point. <clears throat> so what quantization does is it reduces those, uh, you know, representation of the bit. So from 32 bit it might represent the data into 16 bit now obviously if you are changing a bit uh a bit variation of your value you end up getting faster computations right so that's and again quantization is usually not done in machine learning they are mostly in the machine learning world but i hope this makes sense all right any questions so far i hope things are making sense Any guesses or oh, sorry, any questions? So what steps are taken in machine learning space for better inference other than choice of the model? So more commonly, uh, the infrastructure is what uh, most of the people end up focusing on Arjun. So which means that you end up deciding a better machine, uh, be machines, which means that you have good RAMs, good um, processors, um good gpu machines uh, now there are ml inference optimized machines on aws azure uh, which is sort of built to handle such kind of scales and things like that right okay now let's come to the last two points which is case of extreme events how will i be able to track the effect and performance of my model in extreme and unplanned situation the best example of this is COVID. Imagine that suddenly there is a stock market prediction tool, which is predicting. And again, um, we all know that by using machine learning and statistics and deep learning, we can predict the value of stock. Do you all agree that while that is a good way to do that, but for sure it would have never predicted a COVID fall that happened in the stock market. Do we all agree on that point? Correct. Now, just like this, uh, correct, they are called black swan events, right? Um, now, the thing is, do you, all, do you all agree that for any for any damn thing, COVID is a big example that no matter what the business was, not just the stock market, but even if you were predicting, let's say, sales, or if, even if you were predicting uh, revenue, or you were predicting whatever that you were predicting, it would have fall it would have fallen down on the COVID thing because then a lot of things did change. So what you have to also always think about that you have to think about the outlierish events in your data. Now, outliers can also be part of your data. Like suddenly you start seeing a basic outlier happening in your future or a new data, or it could be an event that is something which you would have never thought of. So there, there could be cyclical and seasonal events uh, based on your domain, which is something that you have taken care of. But there could be something, it could be anything that could happen out of the blue. How would you address those issues as well, right? This is again, a question to be addressed, which is what we say, cases of extreme events, right? I hope now it makes sense. The last point is how can I ensure production data is being processed in the same way as the training data was. Um, now, this is very simple to understand, which is what we refer to as data quality issue. A simple way of understanding this is we all do pre-processing of our data before sending data to the model. Correct? Do we all agree on this? 
is there any way i can say that you don't have to cleanse or pre process a data before doing a model can i say that in machine learning i can't right so it could be as basic as doing maybe one or two things only or i'm not saying that it has to be always comprehensive depends on your data but there will be some sort of pre processing that needs to be taken care of all you have to make sure is that when the new or the future data comes in or the production data comes in it has to follow the same set of data quality correct very simple point to understand but very crucial thing a very basic example of understanding this is if you are scaling your data while doing jupiter or while doing initial model building you have to make sure that your production data is also being scaled at the same level do you guys agree with this again nothing um, big here but something which is important for us to remember correct all right now let's come to the most important part correct for transform and transform now the important part is there are two kinds of monitoring see um, like i said there could be um there could be many different kinds of monitoring but there are two bigger subset of monitoring monitoring one is what we refer to as functional monitoring and the other is operational monitoring our focus is not going to be on operational monitoring operational monitoring simply means that you are essentially either monitoring your systems you know for example your cpu ram usage you're making sure that your clouds are all up your uh, your ec2 machines are all up and all of those things so this is basically everything to do with systems in fact if you see at the very bottom it says who monitors what so you can see that your it ops and ml engineers so ml engineers are informed about it but it's not your duty to write uh um, monitorings for these things right so typically this is again for those of you who work in cloud do you guys agree that this is something this is it ops that you're always aware of you might not be doing it but your it team might always be there who might be sending you messages like hey your uh, your machine is down please give us some time before we make it up correct so that's pretty much what the it ops uh, part of the operational monitoring is then your data pipelines and model pipelines this is operational monitoring where um you know we are going to sort of uh, uh discuss in the model part of functional but they uh, they are just operational monitoring means that you're just trying to make sure that these are running right so it's just like logging so it's it's like if you know like we just discussed that you have to take a data and then you have to do scaling for example let's say this is one of the pipeline that is there so operational monitoring is making sure that this particular part is running again and again again and again again and again as per the schedule or the thing that is there then the costing is again you know some again for those of you who have used uh, cloud you know this very well that unless you figure out uh, the costing part um, you won't be able to sort of make a lot of sense your cloud teams will make sure that you are adhering to the cost and you're not just going over the budget and all of those things same thing happens with the inference cost that you have a cost associated so you need to make sure that uh, you address that so this is what we mean by operational monitoring i am not going to talk about operational monitoring it is required for you to understand but it is something which you will again always do in accordance with the it ops or the it team so that's something you can read about okay. however what we are more interested into is the functional monitoring part and then there are three levels of it which is again very logical if you think about one is the data monitoring the second is the model monitoring and the third is the prediction again it's very logical because these are the three major components of your model one is the data whatever is being inputted the second is the model how the model performs and the third is whatever it is predicting you are also measuring that now if you see the data inside data you have data quality issues so you are trying to measure the quality of your data you are trying to measure the drift between the historical and the production data and you're trying to observe the outliers it doesn't mean that you're trying to figure out the outliers all it means is 
that from the historical data, do you see some new outliers coming into the into the data, which your model might not work very well with? Inside the model, you have model drift. How is your model, uh, you know, model behavior changing with respect to the new data? A very simple way of understanding is by drawing a simple graph. So let's say if I if I were to draw a simple graph uh, like this. And let's say in your actual uh, Jupyter notebook, this is the line which we are calling it as a model. But suddenly in the production data, what you observed is that because the data changed, this model is slightly behaving very different. It is not going to behave the way it was supposed to behave, right? So this is what we mean by drifting of the model. The model configuration, versioning, and the adversarial is something that we have discussed in ML flow. It simply means that you're logging everything. You're making sure that everything is being logged. Uh, concerted adversaries are basically doing kind of a QA uh, as to send random uh, and you know different kinds of inputs to your model and seeing whether it breaks the model or not. And the fi final one is prediction, which is you take this only is going to happen when you are when you have the y available for you so when you have y given for uh, future data and you now know how that y is going to come right so it's not magic you absolutely know that you have to do a labeling of it if you have that then you can measure the <clears throat> difference between confusion matrix happening in future data versus the confusion matrix happening in the historical data and which is what we refer to as prediction drift. So again, very simple example. In my current model, I could see a precision of this much number and a recall of this much number. However, in the future data, my precision recalls are sort of going up and down, which is what we are saying we mean by prediction drift. Always remember prediction drift and model drift are different. Prediction drift can only happen if you have a labeled Y data of the future. If you don't have, you will not be able to do prediction uh, drift. Model drift can happen irrespective of whether you have Y or you don't have Y. Because all it is trying to do is it is trying to learn the behavior of the model onto the data. So the same random forest, the way it runs on your historical data versus how the random forest is the same random forest model is running on the future data that is the difference we are observing here again a lot of time people do get confused in the model drift and the prediction drift don't get confused because one is just observing the difference between the model between historical and future the other which is the prediction drift is now measuring the drift between the prediction of the historical and the future right who monitors this data scientists and machines. So this is completely taken care by data scientists and ML ops or ML engineers. Um, in fact, let me stop here uh, because we're going to go in more details in the next session. We will take a bunch of hands on to observe it. Um, I'm also going to show you something very interesting, which is let me delete this. And please fill the feedback. So here's one of the uh, report, which is which we'll see in the next. So if you see this report, what is happening here is um, you'll see two things, which is reference and the current. So reference and the current is basically the same as what we have been discussing so far, which is historical and um, historical and the future. So the reference and the current is the same thing as historical and um, future. So what you're noticing here is how we are measuring both and how we are measuring the accuracy and how the current is uh, uh, this particular things are being changed. You can see how recalls are changed, how precisions are changed. You can see class representations, how class representations are changed, how uh, confusion matrix is uh, changed, how quality matrix are changed. In fact, not just that, this is what the data drift measurement looks like, where you're also measuring how the data of sepal length of the reference data versus the current data uh, is being changed. So you can see how these graphs are helping you understand what the difference is. Again, this is just a trailer of what you're going to see 
um, in the next session. So do not worry. Uh, we're going to go in more detail. We will study all of these things. Um, how to sort of come up with this uh, things. Yes, this is, uh, so let me quickly share two things with you. Um, so this is based on a tool which is called as Evidently. Uh, it's a new tool. It's not very stable. I would not say that this is a tool which you will use in uh, production by any chance. Uh, the reason this is helpful is just for you to sort of play with it, just to sort of see that, hey, okay, all right, this is how things happen, correct? So please don't, don't take this as a production tool. This is just a tool for you to play with, just to see how things can happen. There's a bunch of interesting stuff which is uh, inbuilt into this tool. Maybe down the line one year, this tool might become very stable, but not at this point, right? So the code that I was showing, uh, the code that uh, the report that I was showing you comes out of this code, which we'll discuss in the next uh, session. So did you all get a link? And are you all able to open the link? Okay, can you, can you check now? And the presentation, this is the presentation. So let me also share the link of the presentation. All right, here's the link to the presentation, right? So now you have both, you have the code, you have the presentation. Um, Right now, let me stop here and let's discuss, let's take questions. So again, thanks a lot for uh, having so much patience, guys. Um, let's take questions, whatever questions I've missed. All right, so Nilanjan is saying in production, is there any tool which is used in MLOps teams needs to create own tool? Um, it's actually both at this point, Nilanjan. So all your clouds, your GCP, your AWS, and your Azure currently has a lot of inbuilt MLOps frameworks and tools. Uh, so you can check that out. Um, there's also open source tools which are available. So I would say that 70% of the times you will find a tool uh, of what you're trying to do, but still there is that 30% uh, gap in the market where you, you would not find free tools. If you're on cloud, I would say 95% uh, tools are already there. Um, it might not be very easy uh, to sort of connect everything, but they are there. I hope that makes sense. Um, perfect. Thanks, Avinash. What parameters, metrics you consider while monitoring model drift? Uh, Jessel, we'll talk about this in more detail uh, in the next session. If you go to, um, I think, slide number... 15, you will see some of those uh, things. But we'll talk about that uh, in detail. No worries. What does inference and answer platform stand in ML work space? Yeah, so uh, for example, one of the very interesting platform in this regard is, uh, let me see if I can show that. Uh, so NVIDIA has NVIDIA inference. So, so there's something called as Triton inference server. Um, so enhancer platform, as the name suggests, uh, Jessel is basically platforms or CPUs, GPUs, or any kind of hardware, which is built to increase your inference time. Again, let me actually give you, um, uh, let me actually quickly give you this thing, which is a real use case. See, do you agree, Jessel, that when uh, Tesla has to deploy autopilot, they need to have a very high inference, like they can't wait even for more than two millisecond to response to where the car should go. Do you agree with this? That's, you know, that's kind of a very critical use case. So it is at that level, you need enhancers which can help you do that level of uh, uh, inferences of whatever models are being running in your whole car. This is why I said that please go and have a look at uh, Tesla AI because you will be able to sort of see all of those things in a very, very detailed uh, uh, 
level. So let me actually give you this. So you'll see what um, it essentially, or what they have, they are doing and what they essentially do. So uh, tri uh, Triton is one of those inference servers mm -hmm. which are uh, sort of available from NVIDIA. You should read about this if you want to. Uh, it'll give you sort of heads up of what this is. Thank you, Purnima. Um, Argo, how to handle data drift that is there in something called domain adaption? Does it help in solving the issue of this? Good question. Uh, so data drift we'll talk about in more detail, uh, Argo, in the next session. So we'll talk about what those uh, different things are and how can we address it. But to add on to what you're saying, it's a very valid question. So what you're saying is that, hey, uh, while we can figure out the drift that is happening between historical and the um, uh, the future data, but the bigger problem still lies that if your historical data itself is very biased to start with, or it has issues to start with, uh, what is the point of doing the drift analysis of your data, correct? That's what your the larger picture is or larger point is that whatever issue, if you have issues with data, then there's no point of doing drift uh, anyway. This way. Um, I don't know if you're still here, but yes, you're absolutely right. Um, in the next session, please, any one of you who, uh, who can remember this, please make a note of it. Um, but I will talk about uh, data fairness and biasness. Uh, there are quantitative measures to understand bias in your data. In fact, how many of you remember that I did talk about uh, 360... Yeah. But anyway, um, yeah, three sixty AI fairness three sixty. Sorry, my bad. Um, so, okay, this is this is a very important, uh, very interesting thing. Uh, so please remind me next time if anybody can uh, pin it down. There is a, uh, there's a toolkit called AIF 360 from IBM, which helps you quantify the biasness in your data. And this is, it has nothing to do with monitoring as such, but it's, it, it, it is itself a very important concept because do you all agree that you all get into this issue where um, sometimes you don't know how to quantify the bias in your data. I mean, sure, you can see the biasness by doing EDA, but don't you agree that you might sometimes want to do two things? One, to quantify, like by numbers, say that, okay, my this column has this much bias, and then to mitigate that bias by doing certain, uh, certain uh, mathematical practice. Do you guys agree with this? So this is what uh, uh, this particular uh, thing tries to address. So have a look into it. Um, it has a lot of techniques to address the bias and all of those things. Please share the last session PPT. Uh, what was the last session? Last session, we didn't do any PPT. It was just the uh, codes. Um, and I think I did share uh, all the codes last time. You mean the model interpretability, correct? We didn't use any PPT. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Indri, one major concern is the cost involved for model upgrade based on the performance of the model. Any automated way? No. So, so Indraji, this is where um, a cost analysis has to happen. Um, has to happen way beforehand. Uh, there's no auto. Oh, there's no automated way to address the cost, but there is an automated way to automatically upgrade the performance uh, of the model, but it will incur a cost. Um, and at the same time, uh, what you can do is you can also, if, if let's say cost is a constraint, you can figure out a different technique or a model, which still give you the same inference limits, but on a, a same method. So a good example would be, um let's say you were doing decision trees and then you can just change uh to exe boost uh model that will give you faster inference uh, but more or less there will be a cost associated with this 
ml flow yes so for ml flow if you go to the um if you go to the videos of that session uh data i think uh you will see a github link um uh, where all the ppts and the codes and everything is there so it's there if you go through the whole session you will see um the github link for that uh tinesh can you add me on instagram um you would have to click on a link uh anybody who can paste the telegram link one more time please generally azure or aws provides automation workbench do they also provide monitoring yes uh, aws has, has a very uh, very good uh, monitoring support so you can actually check the documentation and they have written a lot of tutorials um, bargavi so you can actually check that out so there you go so for those of you who want to sort of join uh, you can just click on the link um, to join the chat as well all right perfect any other questions which i missed so again do not worry we have one more session um uh so we'll discuss more things and we'll uh, do more things uh by the way for those of you who are connected on uh, telegram if there is a topic in this monitoring which you would like to see because you already have the slides and if let's say there is something which i missed uh just let me know because i have one week so i'll be able to sort of uh, uh, come up with that so just go through the presentation if you see or, or feel anything which is not um uh, there we can sort of talk about this thanks puna uh, i hope it goes to a positive side outlier impact won be able to understand we'll do a detailed discussion into that perfect thanks isel thanks a lot thanks a lot great perfect so thanks a lot guys um do you use tf in production i have i don't actively but i have used uh that okay thanks a lot guys uh, i'm going to take your leave um just for those of you who want to connect with me on linkedin uh just search my name there are i don't think so there's anybody named lavi nigam who is also a data scientist uh so you should be able to find uh, real quick um and i'll see you guys in the next session have a great day take care bye thank you sir uh, thank you guys for attending the session and see you all on wednesday uh, on the continuation of the session and guys please do share your experiences using hashtag rise with up brad on your linkedin thank you uh, that will help us to improve the you know uh, content of our uh, upgrade rise sessions as well Thank you so much. See you guys. Bye bye. Thanks, Ayman, for hosting. Thank you. Thank you, sir.